Good day, and thank you for checking out the Sportsline podcast on CHCH. I'm Bubba O'Neill. I'm always proud to say that Southern Ontario is the place to be for high-level sports, athletes, executives, and in today's case, people who are simply born to teach. And we love to uncover their stories of success. Folks, if you are familiar with basketball from coast to coast, Joe Razzo has reached the highest level. This Hamilton native has truly done it all. From winning an offset title at St. Mary's High School, there were multiple trips to the U Sports Nationals over nearly two decades at McMaster. His resume may exploded at Canada basketball working alongside the likes of Jay Triano, Steve Nash, and Leo Routens, and so many more. In addition to being an NBA scout, he's currently representing the Canadian Elite Basketball League as an executive and also as a TV analyst. Move over, Mike Fratello. The real czar of Canadian basketball is right here. Joe Razzo, like this is this is an honor for me. I gotta, I, I'm using that word because you really have climbed the level of success in this sport in this country. You're a Hamiltonian. I've known you for years, and we get to sit here and chat about the sport you love. So thank you for joining us. Oh, Bubba, great to be here, and this is brings back huge memories in your new digs here. But wow, there's lots of memories and. And I got to tell you, CHCH was a big part of making basketball great, specifically in Canadian university sport. Mm-hmm. I remember those days. You were pacing the sidelines many of those times. And, uh, yeah, those games of the week. I mean, I just thought that the level that, uh, of play that you would accomplish, the, the success that you had, um, I guess that really did spur you on to levels of success. You know, it, it, was, it, it was a place to be. And, you know, we used it, and there was features on players. It was the heyday. It was the greatest time of university sport because you had a game of the week, and it went nationally, and people knew all about it. It was a big deal to be the game of the week, and we had great crowds, and it's amazing. Uh, You know, technology has changed, Mm -hmm. but it hasn't caught up to where we were. Right. Well, let's see if we can still, you know, we keep banging on the door for those kinds of things to happen. So let me just, let, let's start with this. I mean, there's just so much to talk about. And I know so many of the people here, especially locally, are, are, I think, anxious to see what's going on. So let me, what's up? What's going on with you right now? How have you been? Well, I've, I've been absolutely great. And, uh, you know, if you ask my wife, basketball never ends. When you were <laughs> coaching and now, uh, you know, all the other duties that I'm doing. So it's absolutely fantastic. The CBL takes up most of my time, and that's a, a project of love, and it's a legacy that I hope that continues and grows. Um, got the chance to call the Canada-Nicaragua game last night, and that was a lot of fun, uh, Being, in, you know, dealing with FIBA basketball and dealing with the national team, and they're in great shape and in great hands. So that's going on, calling the going to be out for the college national championships, U sports national championships. So I'm really excited about that and still watching, keeping my eyes on the development of it mm-hmm. and go out and catch a couple prep school games and high school games along the way. And it's built at, the, at that high school level. And when you were in high school and uh, coming up in Hamilton, what was it about the sport of basketball? Because at that time, I mean, I don't think basketball was first on many people's or many kids, boys, girls list as a sport to play. What was it about basketball that attracted you? Well, I got, I, I hit the jackpot. I had the, my, my head, my basketball coach was Patty Papalia, who was a great athlete in town and taught me the game. And he came from that tree that started with Father Kennedy. And mm-hmm. you just kind of developed it. And basketball was important in Hamilton. And you always got a sense of it. And there was enough basketball crony, second generation, you know, and you can go right back to Transway and developing all that. It, it, basketball was always important here mm-hmm. from, from the coverage to how to, to the coaching, the facilities. It was every, on someone's radar all the time. And that um, caught my eye. And that was special to me. But it was my game. Mm-hmm. At the time, like, you know, what were the, those of us that weren't, we were the freaks not playing ice hockey. Mm-hmm. Basketball was our game, and we would search gyms all over the city, Mm -hmm. churches, anywhere we can get into, keys, do odd jobs just to get into a gym. Mm -hmm. And and it was special. And now to watch it grow where it is, it's just outstanding. What about the coaching level? I mean, you go to from playing, you you get into the teaching profession, which you you coach for, sorry, you taught for what, nearly four decades, I believe. Like, what made you say, okay, I want to give back. I want to start coaching this sport. I think something back then, I think you got into teaching so that you could coach. <laughs> <laughs> it was, uh, and, and teaching, like there's always an advantage as, as a coach of being a trained teacher, mm-hmm. because that's what you take on the, on to the court. And I had some great opportunities because I, 
I really started as a manager, like a glorified manager at Mac uh, under Don Punch, but it got me into practice. And getting into practice was the key thing because I was there every day and then eventually I started doing scan reports and started you know, identifying players and talent. And, and then I got to work with, like I said, I had great high school coaching and then Barry Phillips was a mentor and a great coach. So I had a real good development of the game before uh, I took over at Mac, but then I went out and had a great high school program and was blessed with some players mm -hmm. who all turned out to be coaches. Mm -hmm. So the, the love of the game has been there. And I think the whole group of people that have been behind it it was a Hamilton thing. It, like you can go and compete in high school against each other, mm -hmm. but you support each other all the way through. Well, and you've had some. You had success at that level. I mean, my early days of doing television on cable TV, uh, doing more sort of Burlington, Oakville stuff. We always knew about what was going on in Hamilton at St. Mary's, and and you're winning an Offsa championship. And at that point, I mean, it just doesn't get any better than that. No, it was. It was. It was a project where guys stuck together and believed in it. And there was a curriculum. Like, you ran the whole program. You just didn't run it to the senior team. You ran the program. Mm -hmm. And that was so important. But back then, OFSA was huge. Like, if I said we had to get through Michael Meeks and Sherman Hamilton and Rowan Barrett to win OFSA, these are national team players, and you had to be good, and your team had to be solid. So winning OFSA then was very different because it would be like winning – You, there was only the best players that mm -hmm. played at those levels, and teams were great. And with yeah, with all due respect, and I'm glad you brought that up. With and I'm maybe it's good that they've done what they've done, and the fact that there's a, a tier two, a tier three. You're right. At that point, the best of the best were playing, and you not only won that championship, you developed the program of long lasting success. Yeah, and and that was part of it. And you kind of realized and that's what I kind of brought. I learned ahead of time that you had to teach. But you had to run the program, mm -hmm. so the, the the young kids had to be taught the same as the older kids, and you had to develop. But you had to teach, mm -hmm. and you had to teach why. And that was the part that, you know, the people that taught me, were, I was very fortunate. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just a matter of how, this is how you do it. This is, this is why you do it. And if you could explain the why, then everything was always easy. So your abilities as a coach start to grow. People always associate you with Mac, obviously. You spent almost two decades there. But there was Guelph before that, right? I was an assistant coach at Guelph mm -hmm. um, for Dave Arsenal. Okay. And at that time, Dave Arsenal was a defensive-minded coach. But then, since then, he went on to Grinnell University in Iowa and developed that crazy take a shot in 10 seconds, threes, averaging 150 points. And, and Sports Illustrated actually identified him at one time as one of the most unique, top unique coaches in basketball. Mm -hmm. So I had a good education with Dave, and I met Dave through that. So... Being an assistant coach was was so important for my development, and then going on to Mac and, tra and training under Barry Phillips, because that's really what it is. It's, mm -hmm. it's not just being an assistant coach, it's training to be a head coach right. with other coaches. And when you got to Mac, there was just a level of success that was accomplished at that school that uh, there's, I'm not saying they're struggling to get to right now, but they're struggling to maintain in a sense because, I mean, uh, uh, McMaster basketball, OUA championships, uh, getting to the nationals, even through the back door sometimes, that was synonymous with your years there. Oh, absolutely. And, and, I, and, I, and I learned that you recruited good people and you stayed loyal to them and they stayed loyal to you. Mm -hmm. Like there was no back door to Mac. It was a front door only. But the key was we had to get the best players in Hamilton mm -hmm. coming to our games. And then when they came to our games, wanting to be part of our program. And that really started with the Jack Vanderpools and the Titus Channers and the Keegan Johnsons who turned down opportunities to go other places, in some cases scholarships, to stay at home and invest in the city. And, 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 and in return, the city invested back in them. This point, basketball is becoming popular. The coaching profession, I, I, I'm, I'm not to embarrass you here, you're like the Pat Riley of, of your era. No, I really don't. I know you're turning red, but you were. You had that. You had the, a swagger. You, you put on the suit. You, you acted the part, and your players did too. Yeah, but you have to understand, I was never – I was never a player. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, to me, it was, uh, it, it was part of it. Like you played the part, not played the part. You were the part the whole time. And in came to the game, I always said, I think it was just my Italian blood. I said, I'm not dying on this floor, holding the energy in. So I probably got a little bit too demonstrative on the court. But I think back then that was kind of accepted. Mm -hmm. uh, 
but but you're right. We and we had great crowds, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden you're fueling the fire. And we had a great administration, and everything went really well. Mm -hmm. um, and backing, like you played on a Wednesday night, there was a story on a Thursday. The next mm -hmm. day, everybody knew who you were. And between local TV and local newspaper, uh, the community never graduated. Mm -hmm. So we had the community as season ticket holders, mm -hmm. and the student body would change, but the community didn't change. So therefore, our support didn't change. But that success also breeds nationally as well, too, because you're reaching the Nationals. You're getting out to Halifax for for that final eight tournament as well, too. You're, you're getting close. You're winning silver medals as well. And all of a sudden, Joe Razzo's name becomes more popular nationally, and you make that jump to Canada basketball. And I guess Jay Triano was a guy that had an arm in that. Yeah. You, uh, my, my, my first stint was actually with Steve Kinchowski. Okay. He took over the job wow, from okay. Jack Donahue, and I, and I was his assistant. And Jay and I were always friends, and like I lost a recruiting war to Jay Triano when Jay was at Simon Fraser. He beat me out for Steve Maga. But oh, but then Steve Maga bounced back and made my life a whole lot easier. Mm -hmm. And then op the opportunity to go back into basketball Canada when Jay was in charge mm -hmm. and did some scouting. So there's there's been a real key loyalty factor of, of people that we've known each other. But yeah, the opportunity to be an assistant for four years on the national team. Any good, any coach, mm. it's important that they become assistants because it helps you. You've got to teach differently. You've got to teach maybe things that you don't believe in, but you're always learning. Mm -hmm. I thought it was one of the best professional developments of my career mm -hmm. was stepping back as an assistant. Mm -hmm. and, and from that, I guess your days as a teacher are helping you teach in a professional way on a national level for basketball as well. Yeah, and and, and, and I had people back then look like, you know, talk about basketball being important. I, I taught in the Hamilton Catholic Board and uh, I had people look out for me. They created a contract for me where I was seconded to the university. I taught a period of day at the high school mm -hmm. and I and that was important because you know, you always maintained your teaching ability. Everything was still about teaching. Mm -hmm. And if you teach the game, I found that you coach at practice and you coached and you coached in games, mm -hmm. but most of your life was spent teaching. Is it fair to say that in this time, Canada basketball is becoming, and it was a slow grind, and as I'm sure you'll identify, it's becoming a place to be now? Oh, without, without question. Like, I, I think the most important part of it is I think it's really important that basketball becomes and stays the most inclusive sport. You love that and, word. And I love it because I'm not just talking about inclusive in culture. I'm talking inclusive in economics. Mm -hmm. uh, the more the kids that can play, put on a pair of shorts, sneakers, have opportunities to play, then we're just going to get more players. When we were when basketball first started, it was hard to get the best athletes. And now we are getting the best athletes and, and people want to play. Why did that change, Joe? Opportunities. I, I thought opportunities changed it, and I think immigration changed it. I think uh, a lot of young kids started falling in love with the game. It became cool. It became hip. Uh, it wasn't hockey. Uh, you know, I always I always tell people one of the great you know visits that you can make is you can you know you go to a, a Raptor game. And it feels like the city. It looks like Toronto. It, there, there's just a different sense about it. And I think the Raptors have made a huge change, and they've made a huge influence to it, too. Fair to say that it has also changed in terms of popularity for the other gender as well. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's the one sport where you know mom and dad have both played it, being in a driveway, being in a gym class. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden now, you know, every, everybody's an expert, mind you. So <laughs> right, I feel for coaches because everybody becomes an expert. But you're right. It, it's a game that people have an understanding. They've done it. Now you look at, you know, there wasn't courts around. Now there's courts everywhere and there's hoops everywhere mm -hmm. and kids play it. But the Raptors had a huge part of that. Well, obviously their success, yeah, has put basketball certainly in a place. And as I really do agree with you with the immigration thing, um, just a different type of Canadian. Can I say that? That is that that is continuing to grow in our in many communities outside of not just the GTA, but into communities outside of, of the GTA, into Hamilton, uh, Niagara, et, et cetera. Let's just say this. Now, we've always talked about the importance of building a brand inside Canada. And that's where the CEBL has become so important. You know, it showed last night. Canada played last night in a Windows game with 10 players. Eight of those players are CEBL players. 
players who played in the CBLs. You need a domestic program. Canada never had a domestic program. So the only way that you could develop a domestic program with the best players playing in it mm-hmm. is to play in the off season, is to play in the summer, you know, that, that summer, that four-month summer window. And that's made a huge difference because the USA lost the other day to Cuba. The USA was, was, has four former NBA players and a bunch of G League players. But what they don't have is FIBA experience. The CBL develops that FIBA experience. So Jackson Rowe last night, who's still playing in the G League, has FIBA experience by playing in the CBL, and he takes that on the court, and I think that's a huge advantage. So it is the, it was the piece of the puzzle that was missing, and between Mike Morielli, the commissioner of the CBL, and, and, and Michael Bartlett of, Canada, of Basketball Canada, those two guys together have realized the importance, and the partnership is strong. Like last week, uh, 4,000 people were at the Meridian Center uh, to watch Canada play Nicaragua. Mm-hmm. And it's funny that you say that because I think about the league that started like it was at the NBL that 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 kind of got to the CEBL and you were part of that as well too. Yeah, you know, I, 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 pro basketball was so important and 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 development of it. And it was Richard Petko who got me involved in the NBL mm-hmm. because he had this vision of the CBL. Right. And had enough to his vision and putting his money where his vision was, mm-hmm. was so important. He said, and, and I, and I, and I believed him mm-hmm. and I got it. I'm so happy that I did. And, you know, I was fortunate uh, to be around him at that time, but he's the guy that had this idea that other people have had, but he said, no, I'm going to do it. And he put his money there and it's been a success and it's trending in, in, in the right direction. I you know, and, and I had Mike here not all that long ago when he was talking about it, and he sort of said something about the the, the CEBL being the biggest uh, professional sports league in Canada. And I well, just automatically said, no, I'm thinking in my head, no, it's the CFL. But it really is. There's more franchises in the CEBL, and many of them thriving. Oh, my God. It, 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 we're up. We're 10, and, you know, there's a whole pattern on it, but I think it's going to grow. Mm-hmm. But you, you bring in Winnipeg last year. And all of a sudden, you bring in Winnipeg with David Asper as their owner. And it just caught fire. And they drew 7,000 their first game and never saw anything less than 7,000. Mm. And they go up to almost 11,000 in the playoffs. Uh, Winnipeg guys were being identified. They were, they were doing incredible. Calgary is going to play their first game this year in the Saddle Dome. Uh, it has expanded and grown. And... People are enjoying it, and, and, and it, it's more than just a game. The entertainment factor is so important. It's treated as a professional event. I'm all about the basketball, mm-hmm. but if you come as a fan, you're going to be – everything else is going to keep you there. Well, let me ask a tough question. i got to come here because we are CHCH right now. Are we going to get a team back in Hamilton? Well, I think it's uh, the team relates around the arena. You know, and I think, uh, you know, that's been a gray area from day one once the franchise got here. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, so until we have an arena, then you have to bring ownership and all that. Hamilton's a a basketball town. I think it's got to look like it's a Hamilton team. It's got to feel like a Hamilton team. But uh, I I think once if the facilities are there, then there's no reason not to have a team. Um, but right now, between Brampton and Niagara, a lot of the Hamilton fans, I watch them, I see them in both arenas. Right. And they're, and they're migrating out. But uh, yeah, I, I, would, I hope down the road. And part of it is, like, you know, it, the concrete's got to be laid and the seats have got to be in. I'll tell you, because I, I, I was one of the people, I, I, I proudly say that I, I enjoyed the Honey Badgers brand of basketball, the people that came through the program, the players uh, that played on the team. Uh, it, I, 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 was sit, I would sit courtside. It was fantastic. It was great. You're seeing these players. And I remember the first game, I was like, I didn't know what the expect, my expectations were. I, I, I didn't know, was this going to be kind of semi-pro or whatever? Like, I, I thought it was an NBA game. Oh, I, I, I was like, this is wonderful basketball. Yeah, the talent level is guys making that next step and we and, and we've showed it we've had cbl players aj lawson getting his you know opportunity to make a jump to the nba where he wasn't even somebody selected in the draft you know so we've had a bunch of those players that have made that jump but they've also made the jump to europe 
and they've used their opportunities to really shine. Mm -hmm. Now, you think all these guys are the best players, not just on their university teams. They're the best players on their pro teams. They are all the mercenaries going overseas mm -hmm. as the foreigners. Now they come back in the summer, and they got that. And then you put that Canadian content with it where you have identification. Mm -hmm. So it's good basketball, but there's also good stories. The good story here, to, to use that line, your last line there, is that you're teaching. All of this is accumulated as such a, a beautiful package of basketball for yourself. But you have extended the love of the sport to someone probably, well, not probably, someone very special to you, and that's Victor Razzo, your son. Yeah, he, you know, gee whiz, you know, I caught, I, I got the jackpot of having good coaches. So did he. <laughs> uh, his first coach was Tom Heslop. Mm -hmm. And um, Victor and, and Brady Heslop were taught to shoot by one of the best teachers around. And with that, and I always kind of made sure that he had great coaching uh, in his days. And he had guys, Jeff Joseph, Dom, uh, guys at Bless Sacrament that were absolutely incredible. Um, so he's always been around. And then he had Dave Smart. Mm -hmm. well. And then he, you know, he'd go, and then all of a sudden now he's, I have influence on him. Then Dave is you know, the coach with the best record in this country. So he had a chance to develop as a player and then to develop as a coach. And uh, he came on, when we came to CBL, the River Lions, he had helped me as an assistant. They really liked what he brought mm -hmm. and made him the youngest GM head coach in Cuba mm -hmm. and uh, has had a very good career. The, I guess the winningest career in the CBL so far. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he's sitting at 34 years old. Is it, is it, Two questions off this. When you, when you watch him, do you see yourself? Uh, no, I think I, th I see a better version of myself. Okay. Um, because he has the experience of being a player. Right. And he had won two national championships as a player and mm -hmm. won the national championships as an assistant coach. Mm -hmm. So I think he has that added on. And his, uh, he t sees the game. He isn't the way I do. He's taken it from everyone he's been around, right. and he's kind of developed his own path. And now he's uh, director of basketball at Ridley College and coaching a prep team, which is good for him because I think it, that will help him be a better professional coach because he's got to do a better job of teaching younger players. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it's, it's, for me, it's exciting that he's making a living, living out his passion, and that's basketball. Well, you've uh, taken that passion and you've developed it on this too, on a microphone yeah. as well too, as you talked about doing the Canada Nicaragua game as well too for for the for the, uh, the the Canadian national team, but you also do it for the CEBL on a regular basis when the season does come around. When you're doing his games, Victor's games, is it hard to separate a little bit? Yeah. Oh, there's no question about it. You you consciously go into that thinking about it, and then I often ask people after the game, <coughs> and you know. I find that I'm probably, it's like coaching your own kid. You're probably more critical of them than you are positive. And, I, it, and you lean that way. But I can wear two hats. And I think, you know, all the things that I've done, it's like, I'm sure like officials officiating people that they know and like. Mm -hmm. But you still have to officiate. And when you call a game, I get caught up in the game. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I separate that, you know, when he makes a good uh, call or a good timeout or a good decision, I'm going to talk about it. And if he doesn't, if he makes the wrong one, then I'll probably say it too. But uh, being behind the microphone, watching the game, analyzing, I'm watching it as a coach. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, as an analyst, that's the point I want to bring across to people. This is what I see. I might see something two passes ahead, or I might say, I can give you the why they're doing it, or I can give you suggestions. The nice thing about being an analyst is you're never wrong. <laughs> so true. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you can suggest this and all of a sudden they do that. Well, okay, but I suggest that, no, it's, it puts you in the bench and, and it gives you a, a sense of recall. Mm -hmm. I've been in that situation. How do I handle it? Like, mm -hmm. uh, so that part has been real good and doing it for the CBL and doing the national games and developing some, we've got some great young broadcasters that we're developing in the CBL, mm -hmm. but then getting to work this past summer with Chuck Swirsky. Yes, that's uh, right. Oh, that's man. right. Uh, talk about a pro's pro. Mm -hmm. uh, onions, baby, onions. onions. You got it. <laughs> and his enthusiasm for the game, mm -hmm. like I am amazed. Here is Chuck Swirsky, bobblehead Chuck Swirsky, you know, Chicago Bulls like, on a first name basis with Michael Jordan. The amount of work he puts in 
preparing for a CBL game is no different than if the Bulls were playing. And that's a wonderment of him. He's a per- true professional, as you are as well, too. And it's, it is a treat for me, actually, to see you calling these games. You know, there's so much going on with Canada basketball right now, and I think it was such a high, uh, the World Cup this past summer. Uh, it, 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 it was fun. Like, it was great watching that team. Great watching that team accomplish something that we haven't seen in, in, in 20 years. Where is this program at right now? And at this point... The Olympics are coming up, and now it take the, 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 it, we go to a next level right now. Can this team medal? Oh, absolutely. Like When I started, having Steve in camp changed the, the whole program. Like If I go back and look at Rowan Barrett's career, when Steve was on the team and Rowan, Rowan had his best days, having Steve just changed the, the whole thing. Now, we're, Canada basketball is at the point where we're going to cut NBA players on this team. So that's where the depth is. You think we've got a chance as a country, as, as a region, just in Ontario, as a, to have the NCAA Player of the Year, maybe a two-time Player of the Year in Zach Eady. That's right. NBA possible Player of the Year in Shea Gilgis-Alexander. We go to the Olympics possibly with a Shea Gilgis-Alexander backcourt and a Jamal Murray backcourt. we got the best backcourt in the world. So now when we talk about meddling, I'm thinking absolutely. I'm not even thinking of meddling. I'm thinking this is the team, and this is their idea will be for gold. And if you – I can't have, believe you're saying that. Uh, without question. You could not have a conversation with Dylan Brooks and convince him that this is not a gold medal team. This team believes that they're a gold medal team. They want to play the U.S. They're going to have an exhibition game against the U.S. in July and in Las Vegas, July 10th. And, and, and you'll see, this is not just a team that's searching for a medal. This is a chance of a team that's going to have a chance at winning the gold medal. If the United States do uh, get their best players, will that include a LeBron? Or is he past, is that kind of past him now? Um, no, I think it'll, it could include LeBron and Durant. But I was, I was, in 2006, I was in Japan watching the World Championships that had a LeBron, Dwayne Wade, Chris Bosh, uh, Chris Paul, all those guys were on a team. Hall of Famers. Hall of Famers that lost two games. And Mike Krzyzewski was the coach. And the difference is having that FIBA sweat, that FIBA mentality. This is not NBA defense here. This is real defense. And I believe that the Canadian players, because of the program that they've been in, have better FIBA experience overall and are better suited for the, the FIBA game. I know as a coach, there's probably a zillion differences you could probably go on for hours. But to, to our listeners and viewers, what is the, the, the first thing you're going to notice about the difference between an NBA basketball game and a FIBA game? So the 40 minutes is huge, but you're going to play. It's, it's the defense. Like you can do things. You can, you can play a true zone defense. You can play true man-to-man with all the help you want. You can double. It's not like, okay, yeah, I have to leave lanes. We put restrictions on what you can do defensively. The, the defense is the biggest part of it. And teams will shoot early in the clock. But then the rules kind of change. Like the rules in, the, in FIBA will let you be a little bit more physical in the full court. Yeah, but you guys aren't going to like that. Right, but you have to be more technical in the half court. And we're looking right now at some of the best shooters in the world. And where are they coming from? They're not coming from the North America and, and, and the USA. They're coming from Europe where they're spending more time on fundamentals. And you could see the rules have kind of just reverted so that it's, it's, it's neutralizing athleticism. It's funny you say that about the international changing of the NBA and you talk about MVPs there might not be a, the, the top American might be fifth or sixth when you include the likes of Jokic Dokic SGA Embiid who I know has changed to American but he's yeah, yeah. he's from Africa yeah. like it, the face of the basketball is changing and there was a time the dream team one and two complete domination that's not the case any longer. No, the game has grown, and the pro leagues are all better. And so the development of these players are better. And when they're coming to the NBA, they're better players. 
I, I sit back and laugh when uh, the draft came out and Luka Doncic was coming up. And I'm thinking, Luka Doncic just won the Euro Cup in Spain. He was one of the most. He was the player of the year, mm-hmm. and you're telling me that you're going to take a young, tr- you know, Trey Young over a Luca. I I I lost it there, mm-hmm. but you're seeing that development, and it's worldwide. It's a world game now. Mm-hmm. It's a world game. But I think FIBA rules over North American rules. FIBA development is better. I think th- I think we in just North Americans have to take a step back and find out what what aren't we doing that they're doing. Mm-hmm. And I think one of the things is practice. Mm-hmm. And I think they're spending more time on practice. We're spending way too many, way too much time on games. Uh, Stefan Marbury, one of, a, a, a multiple all-star in the NBA, now retired, um, on his podcast, threw something out, which I think just blew a lot of people away. He said, I guess someone was talking about the rise of SGA, Shea Gildas Alexander, a Hamilton product, who has gone on to not just this year be a, a stud uh, MVP candidate. This is now back-to-back years. And he said that, uh, in his opinion, the Canada's best player of all time is SGA and not Steve Nash. I know you know both well. What are your thoughts on that statement? I think it's I think it's a statement he's seeing down the future, mm-hmm. and Shea has a chance to be better than Steve. He's got more physical tools than Steve, mm-hmm. uh, but they're similar. They're competitive. Uh, Steve got one scholarship offer. Shea, everywhere he went, maybe a three star, maybe a four star, always had to prove that he was better. Going to Kentucky. I remember sitting in the gym and watching John Calipari watch him after he had signed at Kentucky. And then all of a sudden we're in the national team camp and he's like, ooh, this guy's better than I thought he was. And you could just see it. But Shea at every level had to prove himself and worked his way up to a, you know, 11th pick in the NBA draft. But still people didn't know how good he was going to be. So I think there's a lot of similarities there. Mm-hmm. But I could look down the future and, and – and I could see it, and I'll guarantee you who the best number one cheerleader would be. It was Steve. We, I was with Steve and Shea in, Phil, in the Philippines mm-hmm. with the national team. And Shea wasn't playing because he was a young kid just going to university. And he, had, he was on the team, but he just wasn't getting many minutes. But every morning he worked out with Steve. Mm-hmm. And you could see that change of pace. There's no, in my mind, there's no question that Shea's great change of pace has been helped by the time he spent with Steve. I've never seen a player. His style is so original. I don't, if you say, well, well describe Shea Gildas Alexander's game. And I tell people at least, you know, because I'm watching OKC games every night now. I'm like, he's got this style. And I don't think I've ever seen a guy go from first to third gear, from third gear to fourth gear, when it goes to attacking the basket. It's I want to call it herky-jerky, but it almost is. But he's doing it on purpose. Yeah, and he's doing it with pace. His handle's absolutely great. You know, Earl the Pearl Monroe back yeah. then had all the flair and everything. Mm-hmm. Shea's doing it, and you're thinking, oh, change it. It's like Luka Doncic. You're thinking, oh, it's almost like they've got a wisdom that other people don't have, and they can slow the game down in their mind, mm-hmm. at, even though it's full speed on the court. And that's what I find. You don't see them taking bad shots, and they take shots that they can make. He's not shooting a pile of threes. He's shooting a good percentage, Mm -hmm. but he knows he can get to the rim. Mm -hmm. And if he can get to the rim, he can get to the free throw line. And to me, the fouls drawn is a stat that people don't talk about. Mm -hmm. And that's what kind of sets him apart. And then he's a good passer. Like, you watch his his games and you're thinking, okay, he's, he's averaging 31 points a game. But it's the crooked numbers he puts up in assists and rebounds that catch my eye. Mm -hmm. Uh and he's leading a young team. This is not like yeah. a, a, a veteran team. He is the vet on this team. He's the guy that's driving the bus. It's a remarkable story. And everybody says, oh, OKC is a young team. And, you know, nobody they're, they're moving a little faster than they thought. This guy's moving a lot faster than people think. He is at that level. He's leading this team. That's kind of, for me, in the conversation, that has to be a big part of it.
Because I think he he says it in so many different ways that, one, I want to be the best. I want my team to be the best. I have high standards. And I think that you see, you're beginning to really see that right now where his team are following him. And I think that's a wonderful, like, I mean, a lot of respect. Oh, and there's accountability. When your best player is working that hard and is holding everybody else, everybody's accountable. Mm -hmm. So you've got to make sure, you know, I've... Remember stories where Bill Whittington said, like, hey, if you got thrown out of practice by Michael Jordan, like you might as well clean out your locker. <laughs> like if you know, if, if Phil Jackson throws you out, then you got a chance of coming back. Mm -hmm. But if he if MJ threw you out of practice, there's no way you're coming back. And I think the OKC guys kind of look over and say, Whoa, here's the standard of play, here's the accountability. We gotta do what he's doing. And that's why I think he's also beloved by his teammates. And he's a good guy too. Yeah, a good he's guy. Got, like so much going on, and the like the fashion, and you know, he's got a kid coming, like, just newly married. Like there's so much going on in his life, yet it doesn't seem to phase him. His game has not changed, and from all accounts, every person that I know him person that I know that know him personally, just says great things about him. And I, and you know what? A couple years ago, I remember just driving in town and. You know, him, I see a nice car outside, and I'm thinking, okay. And then out of the 7-Eleven comes with two Slurpees come Shay and one of his buddies, you know, and they're just doing, like, regular, you know, post-high school things. And, uh, yeah, he's special. But whenever you talk about players, you got to be it's, – it's, the parenting has a huge part of it. Mm -hmm. And his head was on right, and, and uh, having a mom and a dad that support him and a mom who was an Olympian. And imagine at the table thinking, I've been there, you haven't. And uh, so that's kind of like the nurses. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Competition. You know, and, and, and in this world where kids are leaving families at a real young age and, you know, traveling and the parenting part of it is huge. We're in a good we're in a good place right now, aren't we? In basketball. Wow, we're at the, we're in the, we're at the best place. I just like my my head's spinning, and I'm excited for the summer. And you know, we've talked a whole lot about Shea, but Jamal Murray, man, how does he not an all star? Like, how are you yeah, kidding me? That's, uh, are that you was kidding me. That was weird. <laughs> I mean, I know he's had some injuries and stuff, but every I mean, first of all, his his, uh, his performance in the finals was just unbelievable, and get, helping to get his team there. And I and they're almost like Batman and Robin, him and Jokic, like they really are. Oh my God, do you know? You know and and when they are on national TV, like just on na on U.S. national TV, you just watch Jamal's game take it another level. The other night, he like him and Steph Curry were on the floor, and as much you know as Steph is Steph, mm -hmm. man, Jamal was the better player that night. And he, against the, head on, mm -hmm. Denver's been the better team. I think so. It's going to be interesting. Hopefully, we get a Western final between Denver and OKC. That really could happen. Oh, well, yeah. It won't be good for the national team. <laughs> um, but, it, yeah, it'd be great for basketball here. You know, it's been great chatting basketball with you. And, uh, again, I'm going to embarrass you a little bit. We talk about the riches of Canada basketball and the growth. You have a lot to do with it, Joe. And uh, you had a lot of years in it. I, you, I think you got a lot of years more to contribute and do your thing. And I, I, you love to teach. Uh, I have so many people I know in the basketball world that, that identify you as a guy that has motivated them and, uh, and been taught by in some ways. So uh, congratulations for all you've done. Uh, so much more to accomplish and so much more Canada waving to do. So thank you. Oh, thanks, Bubba. Thanks for doing this. This is uh, long overdue and it's a great conversation. And uh Again, you're looking at two freaks who didn't play ice hockey, and we, you know, we love the we love the game. And uh, but thanks, that that's nice, nice to hear. Hey, Joe, continued success. Hey, folks, we do love talking sports from a local, provincial, and national perspective. If you do know of an athlete, team, or event to promote the Sportsline podcast, want you contact us on many of chch's social media platforms and we'll get you right on the coach like joe and while you're at it please comment because we do appreciate your feedback for the amazing minds and hands that make this podcast possible thank you so much for joining us and we will see you tomorrow